the CEO of Borican Neighborhood Health Center. Thank you very much for hosting us here. And also be having the Director of Nursing here be uh, doing something. I'll be in that chair to have something administered. Uh, as Nadel uh, Etienne, and will be joining us shortly as well. So uh, here we are, big day. Uh, really proud to be at this and fantastic medical facility. Every chance I get, I come out and thank the people who showed up day after day when many people were able to zoom into life, zoom into their jobs, and they showed up and were providing life-saving health care. And so I will always be grateful, and that is why it was important to come to this particular site to talk about some very, very good news related to boosters. And we're going to be making some changes to our guidance uh, based on positive trends and uh, with hospitalizations and cases. But before we get into that, it's always important to talk about where we are in the COVID story. It's been going on a very long time, about 28, 29 months. And basically, we're seeing numbers that are similar to what we've seen before. Again, that, that dreaded peak there that was uh, fairly early in my tenure. And we saw what happened uh, when we had literally uh, 90,000 cases back on January 7th. Uh, today our seven-day average is about 3,400. So again, cases per 100,000 back then, an extraordinary 366 cases per 100,000. Today that number is 17.8. So again, you can see a phenomenal trend of uh, the progress we've made till now. But I track these numbers like a hawk. It's the first thing I look at in the morning and I make sure nothing happened by the end of the day. Hospitalizations, uh, again, uh, this is 100,000. Let's look at the uh, hospitalizations. Uh, those have stabilized as well. That's about 10,000 uh, at the peak. Now we're down to 2,200, and uh, that's the seven-day average. So, so we are seeing major declines in hospitalizations. Another good news story. That's our statewide average. Um, so now the good news is we have a booster been approved by the FDA and the CDC, and that gives us a new tool to fight the virus. And thank God we've had vaccines and vaccinations and booster shots to prevent death and serious illness. And that is what the narrative over these many months has demonstrated, that people who are boosted, you still may contract COVID. Yes, you may. But you'll have a much uh, less severe case. You're less likely to end up in hospital and certainly much less chance of death. So for the first time ever now, we have boosters that are approved that are target specific variants. We haven't had that before. These these boosters that we'll be talking about today and uh, now be widely available today are to target the Omicron variants BA4 and BA5, which has been the predominant variants uh, for a number of months now. There's others ones on the horizon we're always tracking, but as I confirmed with Dr. Bassett earlier today, that these are still the predominant variants circulating around this country. So again, having a booster shot tailored to a specific variant is significant. It's the first time that we've been able to achieve that, and that makes me very hopeful that this will be an extraordinarily effective booster shot, and so I look forward to getting my shot momentarily, because I do shake a lot of hands. I think about 4,000 hands on uh, Sunday alone, or Monday. So I'm excited to be immunized, and I want others to share in that excitement and know that they can take control of their own health by getting something as simple as a booster shot that is now going to be available at your local pharmacy. Literally today, there are people in line filling out paper to get a booster shot right here at this facility. So they are now out there. Uh, individual doctors, individual pharmacists have been requesting their uh, supply. Thank God there's no shortage. That was our crisis last year. When there was such a severe shortage, we had to determine based on age and uh, categories of work and people who are most vulnerable could get the booster shots. And now, today, they're widely available, so you just call up, make an appointment, go online, make an appointment, your own doctor, or one of the countless pharmacies that we have in the neighborhood. So anyone over 12 and up is eligible to receive the Pfizer booster. I believe it's still 18 for the Moderna. Moderna. So if you have had your last shot, your last booster two months ago, early July, you are now eligible to get this one as well. So, uh, so get the new Omicron booster. And we're also going to be talking about, you know, continuing to use every tool available to us. And as New Yorkers, we have one shared goal, and that is to get through this together, um, put an end to this era. It, it's been long, it's been painful, and New Yorkers have done an extraordinary job. And I can't thank them enough for what they've done to help us go from the depths of despair, the depth of darkness, uh, as the hardest hit 
community in America, almost the world at the time, but we also want to make sure we get through this together. So again, getting vaccinated boosts is our best shot, but also we have to restore some normalcy to our lives. And so we'll be talking about a new normal starting today. Department of Health will be issuing new guidance regarding masks based on the CDC guidance. And starting today, masks will be optional. You'll be starting to see these signs. This is our subway sign. So places like shelters, correctional facilities, detention centers, and yes, mass transit. You'll see this little character. And I'm told that's a ponytail off to the side. Do you all see the ponytail? OK, I just want to make sure I'm not the only one. Uh, masks are encouraged, but optional. This is what you're going to see on our subways and our mass transit throughout the state of New York. This is buses upstate. This is transportation everywhere. So we're very, very excited about that as well. So big progress. But also, the message at the bottom is very important. Let's respect each other's choices. What that means is you choose not to have a mask. That is your personal decision. You'll do your own personal risk assessment of who you're exposed to, your own vulnerabilities, where you work. You make your own determination. But do not judge your fellow passengers on what their choices are. Uh, let's be respectful. So we want to make sure that uh, we handle that in a mature way, as New Yorkers can and should do. But also a reminder when that masking requirements will remain in effect at adult care facilities as well as other health care facilities regulated by the Department of Health while there's still the variant at large. And so uh, I know this is a big change. The MTA will be rolling out this, the signage, but basically we're going from mandatory to optional. So that is uh, what we're talking about. And so uh, I want to thank everyone who's been complying on our transit systems for 28 months, a long time. Uh, I know for many it became second nature, but it's always been a visible reminder that something is not normal here. And it was there for the right reason. It protected health. And now we're in a far different place than we had been as we continue to watch the trends. This is not a one-day snapshot. This is watching the trends, and we're seeing a stabilization of those numbers. So I want to thank everyone, the New Yorkers who sacrificed, stepped up, and they've done a great job. They really have. And uh, I still expect that we'll see many people on the trains and subways and walking down the streets. I walk the streets of Manhattan almost every day. And I see people still wearing them. That is their choice. We encourage them to do that. So these are encouraged but optional. So that's how we're going to make sure that we get to a, a new place. So I'm very optimistic. Yeah, I'm very optimistic that we'll be uh, assuring each other's respect for this. But as we talk about this, I want to make sure we are getting kids back to school. That was my other number one priority. We talked about this in July. We talked about our fall surge plan on August 22nd as we gave updates to make sure that parents know we welcome the public school kids back to school in the city tomorrow, all over the state. Many are going back today. And also say we want to do every, we'll continue everything we can to keep our children safe in schools. So I want to let everybody know we're going to continue watching the numbers. We're watching global trends. We're watching for variants. We're watching for any updates and vaccines, but we do believe that we're in a good place right now, especially if New Yorkers take advantage of this booster. That is how we get back to not just a new normal, but a normal normal, and that is what we're striving for. So uh, I'm excited that we've been able to achieve that. We also said we get kids back to school. We also we wanted to make sure there's enough test kits. So we kept our promise. We got over you know, almost 3 million test kits out already. So when they go back to school, if they need to be tested, they're stockpiled. We've sent them to private schools, uh, charter schools, public schools. They are all over the state. We have plenty stockpiled. This is important to me as I have conversations with Catherine Garcia, head of our state operations, to make sure that we are not ever in a vulnerable position again with respect to supplies. So we have amassed over 15 million test kits are in inventory right now to be able to handle any potential surge coming up. Because uh, if a surge comes, as we saw last winter, you know, Omicron wasn't even a variant. It wasn't defined until the end of November. And immediately, uh, there was a run on test kits. And we worked tirelessly to make sure we had enough so when kids went back to school in January, that there would be no barriers, that we had plenty of test kits. And that's what gave people the confidence to know they can go back. So we will always be aggressive, make sure we leave no stone unturned, to make sure New York is positioned to protect our citizens. It's my number one job. So uh, we're always watching the data. Uh, our fall action plan is up and running. And again, the last thing I'm going to encourage you to do, 
go get your shot. So all the members of the media, you can get your shot before you leave here today. So uh, just sign up. And so with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Bassett and uh, thank her again for her extraordinary service to the people of the state of New York. Thank you, Governor. Uh, so the governor has really covered our news today very comprehensively. Uh, I think the big news on the booster is that for the first time, as she's noted, we have a booster that is tailored to the dominant variant that's circulating. Until now, we've gotten a lot of value out of a boost, out of a vaccine that was designed to address the initial uh, variant that was identified in Wuhan, China. Uh, now we have a vaccine that is tailored to the circulating variant, and we have a lot of confidence this will bring people much more protection. You know, there, uh, people may feel confused about the number of boosters and shots they're supposed to get, uh, but it, we can keep it simple by saying that if you're 12 and over and you've gotten your full primary course, course course of vaccines, that's the first and the second shot, uh, you should uh, get a booster. It doesn't matter how many boosters you've had before. Uh, if it's been two months since your last shot, uh, you should look into getting another booster. Uh, for the 12 to 17-year-olds, it's the Pfizer, uh, and for anyone 18 and over, either the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines. Uh, are available as boosters. So these are being shipped out to the commercial chains, uh, and I, I think that those are quite ubiquitous. I've just been to one myself, um, just up the street from here. Uh, so just check and see, make an appointment, go get your shot. And while you're at it, remember that flu season is coming. Uh, we hear from the Southern Hemisphere, then Australia, that they've had a difficult flu season. So remember to get your flu shot as well. On masking, uh, as you've heard, we uh, continue to require masks in hospital and healthcare settings, including nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes are an important setting because, as we know, uh, the elderly, people 65 and over, uh, have borne the brunt of severe illness and mortality during this. We also are requiring ma uh, masks in adult care facilities, but in other settings, we urge people to pay attention to their community level. Uh, the CDC makes that available. When the community level is high, which it is no longer in New York City, it was for a long time, uh, the CDC recommends that people wear vaccines. And of course, all individuals may have their own reasons. Uh, I uh, have a 94-year-old mother who's agreed that I can invoke her uh, because she's the reason that I'm very careful about uh, wearing, uh, wearing a mask. And additionally, testing continues to play a role. So all of these together, getting all of your shots uh, that, are, that you're eligible for, uh, paying attention to your context, I'm confident that we're going to be heading into a winter where we will um, be able to contain COVID. So thank you very much, uh, you, Governor. Thank you. All right, now for the show. Let's, let's get this over with.
And it's that easy. It's that easy. So I encourage all New Yorkers, let's be really smart. Let's get it done. This booster is going to be better than all of them because this is tailored to a specific variant. So, so with that, I'd be happy to open up to any questions. Yes. Governor, uh, one question for you and one for Dr. Bassett. On lifting the masks in, in transit, why make it effective immediately? There may be some folks who wore their mask on their way to work today who are unsettled to hear that on their way home tonight it's purely optional. Did you consider starting this at the top of a week? And, and what was the final sort of factor for you to, to remove the mask? Yeah, that's a good question, and you know, for people who are, I don't know if they'd be unsettled. People have been, a lot of people have wanted this, and if people want to ride the trip home and wear their mask again, there's no stopping them. We really, this is so um, voluntary, it's optional, it's personal discretion. We've been watching the numbers. You know, I've been talking about this for months now, saying we would get to this point when the numbers have stabilized, but also the advent of having this booster available, I think everyone should get this booster immediately. It starts taking effect and have that higher level of protection. So it's based on a stabilizing of the numbers. You know, we haven't seen any spikes. And also, people are getting back to work and they're getting back to school. And we're just, you know, while you're in those places not wearing a mask, uh, it makes sense to not worry about it on the way. But again, I'll let Dr. Bassett answer on, specifically on that. Well, my question for Dr. Bassett sure. about the new booster is one of the things that happened after the last round of boosters is that everybody seemed to get COVID anyway. While it did prevent serious outcomes, deaths, and hospitalizations, people tested positive. Do you believe that the new booster, since it's Omicron specific, might reduce the reality of testing positive at all? Yeah, this, this is a really important question because all of the variants, and they've all been Omicron variants, have proved more what we call immune evasive uh, than the ones before them. So even people who were infected uh, during the first wave with the first Omicron and then got infected with subsequent variants. So we're very hopeful that this one will protect better against infection uh, because it is tailored to the circulating variant. Uh, but the fact is that we don't have those data yet. Uh, it stands to reason that it should. But I, I just want to reiterate that it is not a small uh, positive of vaccination that you're much less likely to get very sick, hospitalized, or die. This is a very good reason to get your booster. We know that immunity wanes after vaccination and it wanes after infection. Uh, so if it's been more than two months since you got your last shot, you're 12 or over, uh, you should get boosted and this time it can be with a booster that we think will provide people with a lot more protection. DOH license, yeah, it, it, it takes effect immediately because the other issue we find if we say, well, we're going to announce this today for a week from now or next Friday, we're going to say, well, what's the difference between now and then? So, we, you know, we've, we're adapting to the needs of New Yorkers and they, they would think, well, why can't I do it today if you think it's okay? That is why it is immediate, it is effective. Right now, if someone takes the subway, they'll see the new signs uh, as we speak, I believe. Is that, am I accurate in that? As we speak, I think. Uh, and so, uh, with respect to the second part of the question. Taxis and healthcare facilities. Yeah, uh, healthcare facilities, all healthcare facilities in the state of New York. Um, licensed, I mean, they're all licensed. Yes, they're all licensed. They're all licensed, yeah. It will include uh, Wait, also uh, healthcare facilities that are licensed by the Office of Mental Hygiene. Uh, so all of these are settings in which masking is currently required. This is not a change, and we are retaining masking. This is to protect both visitors, patients, and staff. Uh, as you know, during these uh, surges that we've seen, we've had very many staff out uh, due to illness themselves. So this is to protect everyone in a healthcare facility where we know there'll be people infected. Same goes for nursing homes. You look at the vaccination numbers, and one thing that still jumps out at you is kids. Uh, we didn't even look at the young children, but that number's even lower than the 5 to 11. It's still down. We're heading into the school year. We perhaps presume some level of surge, as has happened in previous years. Is there any consideration to um, mandating the vaccine for young children, as New York City already does and has established case law for, for the flu shot in New York City? Any consideration to that to boost the numbers? Well, certainly considered, but also there's limitations. First of all, as long as these are administered under an emergency use order, 
we don't have the ability to do that. But secondarily, if they were if that emergency use order was lifted and they became permanent use, then it would have to go to the legislature for their approval. So it's not just an overnight decision. That certainly would have would have had been the case with the flu shops that are mandatory. So we are lifting masking requirements in those settings. I'm not sure that Rikers Health Facility is considered a hospital, uh, but there are certainly are health services there, and uh, in the clinic I would expect uh, that they would continue to wear their masks. In the, the, in the clinic, clinic, yeah, the yeah. Governor, I wanted to ask about the conversation we're still having about uh, remote work, going back to the office. We hear the dialogue again this Labor Day about companies pushing people to get back into the office. But it seems like there's an entrenched sector of the workforce that does not want to go back to work, regardless of what the pandemic conditions are. How urgent is this from a public sector point of view at this point to get workers back or are priorities starting to shift from your point of view? I think it's critically important. We need people back in their jobs, if not to five days. You know, it's obviously up to employers, but I think a hybrid situation works very well. And I always joke that if someone had told the majority of workers in February of 2020 that you can now work flexible from home on Fridays, people would have thought that, my God, that's the greatest gift. I never would have imagined that. What a great boss I have. So our, our expectations have shifted a lot. And we are encouraging to come back and, again, making sure that they're boosted. If they're worried about their safety, get it boosted. And you know I track the subway ridership numbers. And I know that people may be hesitant to come on a Monday morning at 8 o'clock, but we're seeing the numbers almost back to normal on weekends, Sunday brunch time. So people, you know what I'm saying? They, they, they're finding a way to uh, still use the subways and overcome their concerns about them. Um, It's called Exempt in 300. Um, but it's an excellent point. We have, as the leader of the state, I want people back to work because it is better for the communities. It's better for safety on the streets. The more people there are, that is important to me. I focus on public safety all day long. But also the livelihood of a lot of businesses surrounding them, the little bodegas, the little hair salons, the, uh, the, bar, the, uh, the dry cleaners, you know, the place, you know, little place you get your milkshake protein shake. Sometimes it's a milkshake. Um, those have to thrive. I mean, they've, they've been hit hard. They've been hit so hard. So I want to see that vibrancy back. But I will tell you, I, I talk to business leaders every day. There is a dramatic psychological shift in this city from what it had been just a few months ago. Uh, I was on Broadway last night. Funny Girl is outstanding. I, I encourage everybody to see it. it was, it's extraordinary to see the crowds, the people coming. The only thing holding back is the international travel, but the hotels are booked. Uh, you know, the U.S. Open, you know, no one hesitated to come here. So I feel that we've really turned the corner, and if we can get people feeling comfortable to come back in a hybrid situation, you know, that, that's real progress. But there's an energy and a vitality out there that was not out there just a few months ago. Because I, I, I have a real pulse on this city. I, as I said, I walk it all the time. I'm out everywhere. Uh, you just don't see me because I'm wearing a ponytail and a baseball hat. So I'm slipping in and out. But I really do think we're in a good place. All right, Morgan, last question. Uh, Governor, the state comptroller is predicting about a $10 billion um, state budget deficit in the near future. Um, fiscal watchdog groups during the state budget process urge you to set aside more money um, in, the federal, in, the, in the state reserves. Um, do you regret maybe spending money on the Buffalo Billion Stadium and um, getting these discretionary funds to lawmakers and not setting that money aside? No, they're not protect. What we're talking about is the money that we set aside. We set aside almost $9 billion. A year ago, when I first became governor, our state had 4% in reserves, which is extraordinarily low. It is unhealthy. I manage budgets at the local level, and we always were told by our accountants, you want to have 15% reserves for the rainy day, or as we used to say, a blizzard day. Because of my stewardship of the finances of the state, we will be approaching 15%. I put aside 
enough money. So the rating agencies and everyone else is saying that was the smart thing to do despite the pressures from a lot of people to spend every dime we had last year. So we made this tough decisions at the time in anticipation. And I said this at the time when I rolled out the budget in my state of state, I said I can't always count on, number one, unprecedented resources from the federal government to help us with COVID. Can't count on it. I cannot count on unprecedentedly high tax receipts like we had last year, nor can I count on Wall Street generating the profits uh, and the revenues that we had. So I planned for that. It's just so everybody knows we planned for that, we prepared for it, and we took action to be ready for it. But thanks for coming, everybody. Get your booster shots before you leave the building. Thank you. Okay, bye.